So we get a slight break this morning from the Gospel of Matthew to be in the Gospel of John. And Jesus' first public words in the Gospel of John are not heavy hitting. They're not theologically dense words. In fact, they're not even really just words on a page like I might be reading now. Those words are a question. Jesus asks a simple question, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? It's a bit clunky, especially with the verbiage in the Greek, but you can also translate the sentiment of that question as, what are you seeking? Or what do you hope to find? Or what do you need? Or what do you long for? What are you looking for? I'm pondering that question as today we commemorate and we remember the life of Martin Luther King Jr. and we celebrate his national holiday tomorrow. Dr. King had a dream. Many of you know his speech. He had a dream that the world would be fair, that things would be equal, that people would be free from exile, and that free people and slaves would one day sit down together at a table of brotherhood and mutual community, and that freedom would one day prevail throughout the country. What are you looking for? What do you long for? I myself, I long for honesty and integrity, both in our church and in our world. I long for the day when ethnicity and color is not an issue. I long for the day when ability or disability fades away, when old and young are no longer categories that define us, or when all of the things that our society says we shouldn't do aren't our only options. I long for a day when this community of faith can handle both the joys and the struggles of life together, when people are so on fire because of the encounter that they've had with Jesus that they can't help but to share it with others. I long for the day when we can confess our part in the cycle and the system of sin. I long for the day when the phrase, that's not how it's always been done, is no longer uttered and it's replaced with, this is the new thing that God is doing in our midst. How cool is that? I long for the day when we practice radical hospitality and we really, truly do mean that anyone is welcome. I long for world peace. I long to an end for physical violence, an end to hateful, hurtful words and bullying. And I long for the day when we take prayer, hope, and spirituality seriously. I'm not quite sure any of that is what Jesus had in mind, though, when he asked that question. Or maybe it was. Maybe that's exactly what Jesus wanted to know from those two disciples of John the Baptizer or John the Witness, as he's probably better known in the Gospel of John. Jesus has just been baptized like he was last week when we were in Matthew, and John comes up to Jesus remarking to everyone who was around, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Son of God. See, John is always and forever pointing to Jesus. We've said that before, but that is chiefly his job. He's always pointing toward the Messiah. He pointed Jesus out to his own disciples, and two of them turn around and start following Jesus. And then Jesus asks them what they're looking for. Now, they don't exactly answer Jesus. They address him as rabbi, which means teacher, and they ask him a question in return. Where are you staying? Where are you staying? The word for stay here doesn't mean what hotel are you at or what house did you rent or what friend is letting you couch surf with them this time. No, the question really is where is Jesus dwelling or abiding or remaining? Simply put, they want to know where they can come and just be with Jesus. And then Jesus issues their invitation. He doesn't answer them either. He doesn't grill them as to whether they're worthy enough to be with him. He invites them. And invitations are always about relationship. And that's important for us to note today. We don't always have to have answers for people, but we can be in relationship and to truly value and see another person for who they are. That's what's behind this relationship that Jesus offers as he issues his simple invitation. Jesus tells these disciples, come and see.
come and see. Three simple words. A simple invitation. It's not threatening, it's clear, it's relational, and it's something that any of us in this room can say. I've always argued that those three words, come and see, are three of the most powerful words that you could ever utter to someone else. And I remember in my life the first time someone said those words to me. His name was Cary Mangus, and he was a friend of my mom's. Cary and his brother and another friend owned a local sporting goods store in my hometown of Roanoke, Virginia. And he was well known and well respected in the community, but I knew Cary from church. And when I met him, he sang tenor in the choir. He had a beautiful voice. He could harmonize with just about anything or anyone or anything that you put in front of him. But Cary was also a guitar player. When I told him I was learning to play guitar in the sixth grade, he said, Hey, we've got this men's club band that we play with one night a week here at church. Why don't you come and join us? Come and see. And that was the first time that anyone really cared enough to invite me to join them for something. I played absolutely awful. I knew like ten chords, but that really didn't matter. It was the relationships that I built. It was the prayer that we had together. It was the opportunity to be in the presence of Jesus and to be as real and honest as we could with one another. And that's what John, the witnesses, two disciples experienced as they came and saw where Jesus was staying. They remained with him the whole day after that. These two disciples encountered Jesus. And after you encounter Jesus, your life is never, ever the same. I don't mean just what you get when you come to church. I mean when you actually really encounter Jesus. When Jesus sees you and when he knows you intimately like Jesus and God tend to do, then you're either A, terrified, or B, you're hooked. It's like the poem that I quoted in this month's newsletter article that stated, God does not leave you as you are. God sends you back, stripped of all of your presumptions, making for home by another way. One of John's disciples who followed Jesus that day was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Andrew goes back home by another way and finds his brother Simon and says, We've found the Messiah. And Andrew and Simon Peter come back to Jesus together, and Jesus changes Simon Peter's name to Cephas. And all three of them find their lives changed that day by the relationships they build and their encounter they have with one another. Once you encounter Jesus, nothing is ever the same. There are a variety of ways in which you can encounter Jesus, and I wholeheartedly lift them up to you. Most of the ways that you can encounter Jesus revolve around being in relationship with other people. Take a risk to start a conversation with someone else. Ask them about who they are, what makes them tick, what their passions are, and where they've been disappointed in either faith or life. Come and be a part of the atmosphere of Peace Cafe in between services on Sunday mornings where meals are shared, but also where community is formed. If you want, maybe you can even lend a hand to the group who serves and who volunteers to clean up and serve and how they build up and support one another. The Priscilla Circle does much the same thing. You can join the choir or Mimi singers at River Ridge as they share their love through song and as they encounter Jesus through the music that the Holy Spirit courses through their very being. Do something, though, to encounter Jesus. Join a class around here. Come back for a refresher course and confirmation. We meet right after this service. You can just stay. It'll be fun. Get involved in some kind of advocacy work and put your passion for people into action. Support the work of Samaritas and their work with foster care and adoption and refugees and people with disabilities. Encounter Jesus, though, through building a relationship with our missionaries, Colin or Jenny or our seminary and Kevin. Whatever you do, heed Jesus' call to come and see. But don't just stop there. Once you come and see Jesus, once you get what you're actually really looking for, don't forget about it or to put him on the back burner. Share Jesus with others. It's simple. All you have to do is invite. All you have to do is say, come and see. And then you just have to sit back and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. 
Because the good news of Jesus and of his love for us and for the world, regardless of who we are or who we think we are, is that Jesus is the best thing we have to share with others. I keep saying our world needs to hear it, and it is so true. We can't be afraid to share our faith. And it's really simple. All you have to do is invite, like Jesus did. Jesus says you matter. Jesus says the world matters. Come and see.